For my first video, I thought I'd stick to the realm I know the most of and love the most, film. For anyone who doesn't know, I'm a second year film student and aspiring filmmaker. When it comes to women in and around the film industry, the issues stretch from the wage gap to the lack of recognition. In full table of content style, here is a breakdown with timestamps on what I'm going to be looking into today. Seemingly confined to our entertainment and leisure time, film is first and foremost an art form. But more importantly, it is the art of storytelling. Now, why is storytelling important? The short answer, we love it. In the wise words of Michael Dunner, we love films and storytelling as a people. It's just a human compulsion to listen and to tell stories. But the long answer, the stories we spend our downtime watching hold great power. Beneath the catchphrases, typecasting and effortless laughs. Hey, how you doing? remains ideology, a thematic stronghold, and voice. When you combine our undivided attention, or our time, and our couch potato whisk energy, or our silence, you're left with a space for manipulation. Or better put, thought. And this space is almost entirely controlled by filmmakers. Hence, they use stories to reflect thoughts, ideologies, and voices. The next question to ask is, who's thoughts, ideologies, and voice is being presented to you in the cinema, in your living room, or in your bedroom, alone, at night, 2am, when you've got no one to call or turn to, and you're tired of thinking about whether or not One Direction are going to get back together because they're not, they're just not, Cynthia, or otherwise known as online streaming services. Where does that stuff go after that? You guessed it, your brain. Thus, film is important to our society because it does shape and change the way you think or perceive things, people, issues, historical events, and more. Film, just like literature, employs perspective in its stories, and in the words of Lauren Dubois, decides whether or not you are on the shore or on the boat when Columbus arrives. Thus, stories are visions of reality on screens for us to relate to or for us not to relate to. Women on screen refers to the portrayal of women in films via characters within plots. The first thing I'd like to explore is problematic tropes. Firstly, the cool girl, and then secondly, the strong black woman. Cool girl. Men always use that, don't they, as their defining compliment. She's a cool girl. Cool girl is hot. Cool girl is gay. Cool girl is fun. Cool girl never gets angry at her man. She only smiles in a chagrin, loving manner, and then presents her mouth for fucking. I mean, yes, they're skinny and yes, they're white, but look at them. They're just so drop-dead gorgeous. As you will see more detail on the other videos, this otherness isn't cool without the essential hotness factor, which we could go into more detail as to why we see them as hot and how this is a hurtful expectation to portray. But for now, this trope says... It doesn't matter how much beer you drink, how much sports you watch, or how much you know about cars or motorcycles, it's just not attractive unless you physically are already. Next up, the strong black woman. Don't you think I ever wanted other things? Don't you think I had dreams and hopes? What about my life? What about me? Here's where I take what I paid 75,000 rand to learn and offer it to you for free. Dear University of Cape Town, thank you. The strong black woman can be subsectioned in two. One, the nurturing, asexual, overly selfless mammy. Two, the argumentative, highly hostile, emasculating sapphire. Three, the lazy, dependent welfare queen. And four, the sexually promiscuous Jezebel. These portrayals, however different, converge to create a universal idea of the strong black woman that feeds into society and the unfair expectations we hold to black women, which include they can handle anything that comes their way, they have struggles to overcome, they don't have time to experience emotions, loving ones and or anxiety and or depression and or feeling overwhelmed, etc. They are the rock of the family and or community, selfless to the point of having no personal needs. Basically, a persona and performance of managing a difficult life with dignity, grace, and composure. But tropes are only a small part of a large ideological picture. Women in film are constantly being portrayed as if their only interests are fashion and makeup, and when those are their interests, they're seen as shallow or without self-esteem or unintelligent. Their stories often follow the journey from singleness, which is seen as undesirable, but that's another story for another video, to happy couple ultimately ascribing their happiness to a male counterpart. Then they have the nerve to call this load of bullshit, although entirely watchable, enjoyable, and defining my teenage life and beyond, chick flicks, or in some circumstances, 
women films, then they create a bipolar opposition. How many films have you seen where women have careers, but they're so career-driven that their relationships, family life, and, well, just about anything else is not at all what they want or not in the picture? And all of this is without the fact that women are about three times as likely to be sexualized in a film than their male counterparts. All in all, on screen, we need more visual material on women in our own and other cultures. But we also need to see how women everywhere are changing and struggling with the situations in which we find ourselves. According to their research, the ratio of men to women working on films is 5 to 1. Beyond that, there is an obvious gap between the number of women working as directors, writers, executive producers, editors and cinematographers, so the production jobs in essence, excluding the crew jobs, and their male counterparts. Why does this matter, and how will this, if at all, make a difference to the stories on screen? In her TED Talk, Dr. Stacey L. Smith remarks how women behind the camera can change how women are seen on screen. In her research, female directors are associated with more girls and women on screen, more stories with women in the center, more stories with women 40 years of age or older on screen, more underrepresented characters in terms of race and ethnicity, more women working behind the camera in key production roles. If we need to tell more women's stories, we need to let more women tell stories. Not to be confused with women on screen, women in front of the camera refers to your women actors. In studies undertaken by the New York Film Academy in 2017, the following was revealed. 25.6% of women actors get partially naked, while only 9.2% of men do. And I know it seems weirdly futile to be arguing about the differences in earnings in millions of US dollars when almost half of the population in South Africa live below the breadline, but there is a large gender wage gap that is worth drawing attention to in order to truly illustrate women in the film industry. In 2017, the highest paid actor was Mark Wahlberg, who was in four films that year, including Transformers, The Last King and Daddy's Home 2, and earned $68 million. Only after Dwayne The Rock Johnson's 65 million, Vin Diesel's 54.5 million, Adam Sandler's 50.5 million, Jackie Chan's 49 million, Robert Downey Jr.'s 48 million, Tom Cruise's 43 million, Shah Rukh Khan's 38 million, Salman Khan's 37 million, Akshay Kumar's 35.5 million, Chris Hemsworth's 31.5 million, Tom Hanks's 31 million, Samuel L. Jackson's 30.5 million, and Ryan Gosling's 29 million comes Emma Stone's 26, Jennifer Aniston's 25.5, and Jennifer Lawrence's 24 million, who come in just before Ryan Reynolds, Matt Damon, and Jeremy Renner in the 20 highest paid actors of the year. Not to mention, there are three white women. I feel it is clear that sexism exists within Hollywood on screen, in front, and behind the camera, but I want to leave this video on a high note with a few of my recommended films or television series. First of which is When They See Us, which is directed by Ava Dunry. It's actually not directed by this mythical person, but rather Ava DuVernay. A story centered around the Exonerated Five, which features incredible performances from African-American women. Next up, Frozen 2. Although the first one made its point of sister love over the romantic one, the second one just solidified it even more. The Mindy Project, a rom-com medical series starring Mindy Kaling, unraveling the expectations of the romantic comedy and putting the Indian woman in the lead role with a white best friend, and Mary and Rhonda Switcheroo. Grace and Frankie, a cute sitcom about two 60-plus women who get divorced and navigate the growing pains of being elderly, develop vibrators from women who have arthritis, and break out of an old age home. She's got to have it. The film or the series, the revised version, Nona Darling navigates her friends, a job and lovers, a tale of black women and a reclaiming her relationship with love and sex. Insecure, a black feminist comedy masterpiece. Just hilarious and fantastic. Watch this, watch it. Black female friendship is just not like white female friendship and this is like the black equivalent to girls. Sex and the City, the series, an oldie, not necessarily a goldie, empowering women sexually, check, female protagonists that are vastly different, check, exploring feminism as a woman's right to choice, check, white, upper class, heterosexual and monogamist in nature, Absolutely. however, I did find it refreshing to see women's issues, especially the sexual ones, portrayed on screen. Then finally, something I have just gotten around to watching, The Morning Show, exploring sexual harassment in the workplace, the most talked about, impactful, but yet least understood part of the Me Too movement that affects millions of people every day around the world. It gets explored and picked apart from every angle. A must watch.
I realize my television series bias in these recommendations, but nonetheless, go forth and change the world. One half hour period of sitting on your couch at a time. Stay home, stay safe, and sanitize this lockdown period. I'll see you next time on Feminist Friday. Thank you.